Good morning, everybody. Welcome to From the Deep End. Uh, good to be with you here on this uh, September 20th. Um, looking forward to a good day of programming here on Digital Bible Study. Uh, Tuesday is often uh, our busiest day. Uh, of course, we're here from 8 to 10 Eastern Time, uh, and so we'll be on for the next two hours uh, doing From the Deep End uh, Truth Tuesday. We'll not be on at the 10 o'clock hour just because uh, uh, Daryl is having another checkup over at the uh, uh, the Medical Center at Vanderbilt University, and so we wish him well for that, uh, and hopefully that will uh, uh, return some good news for him. Uh, Daryl needs as much good news on the health front as anybody does, and so uh, from what he mentioned in the in the group chat that we are in together, sounds like he's expecting some good news, good news and we are hopeful of that with him as well. Um, and the 11 o'clock hour, Tony Brewer and Aaron Dodson will be on with Christianity Today uh, as they look at some current event type things relating to, uh, well, Christianity today. And so that's the name of the program. And that's why. So uh, uh, they'll be on for that hour. Uh, Paul Mays will be on at one, uh, continuing his uh, sermon and song uh, series that he does on Tuesdays. And then for Connect tonight, uh, we have, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, went ahead and slid uh, Paul Mays into that slot as well. Paul is going to be on with another gentleman. Uh, Dennis is his first name, and I can't remember this, his last name off the top of my head. I should look that up before we went live today. But um, they're going to be doing a little interview type session uh, and uh, talking about uh, Paul's uh, journey to um, uh, becoming a Christian and, and so on. He was going to do that as a separate live stream about 730 or so. Um, and I said, hey, Paul, you know, instead of dividing up our audience, why don't we just move you up a half an hour? And just give you that hour to, um, uh, excuse me, to have that session together and so on. So uh, I'm not sure if I will be on to start that or not. Uh, i got to check with Paul and work out some of the details because this was this was last minute. This was after we went off the air last night. Uh, Paul and I were messaging back and forth and he had to confirm with Dennis. So we still have a few, a few little details to work out throughout the day today. Uh, but in the 7 o'clock hour. Uh, we will have a very special episode of uh, what, what will be uh, Connect for tonight. Uh, and uh, the speaker that you know, of course, is Brother Paul, and we are looking forward to having him on there as well. Uh, and then, of course, in the 8 o'clock hour, uh, we will be doing the po Cogitations podcast with Tony uh, and looking forward to having Tony Brewer back with us uh, in that hour as well. So that's what we have on tap for today here uh, at Digital Bible Study. I hope you will... Uh, uh, make plans to uh, tune in and to uh, participate in as many of those shows as you can uh, throughout the day today. Um, of course, this program is entitled From the Deep End, and it is a two-hour program, and we are here uh, to do two things. In the first hour of the program, uh, we simply answer your Bible questions. Uh, you are in charge of the show, and whatever questions you put into the comment section, I will try to uh, my best to give you a Bible answer to them. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a textual question. It can be some kind of Bible topic, or it can be some kind of, uh, like yesterday, we had a couple of current event type questions that um, we try to make some kind of biblical application to those events. So whatever's on your mind, if it if it has a, uh, a spiritual component to it, we will do our best uh, to discuss it. As always, uh, well, two things. Number one, Outside of uh, the spiritual component, uh, as it is football season, Alabama football questions are always welcome. Uh, you, can, you can talk about Alabama football anytime you want. Jonathan, I see you're in the room. And yes, Georgia is looking very good. Um, and let's just wait till December. I have, I have a feeling we're going to see each other in December and we'll talk then. But Jonathan, yes, Georgia is looking very, very good. Uh, I'm not going to cut, cut I'm not going to try and deny that at all, brother. Uh, so anyway, uh, but th those questions are always, is always allowed. But number two, if you do ask me, not an Alabama football question, but a Bible question, I always reserve the right to give you the answer. I don't know. Um, that is a lesson that you need to learn early in your Bible studies. Sometimes the words I don't know need to come out of your mouth because there are some questions we just can't answer. So uh, if that's the um, if that's the case, one of two things is true: either my my knowledge base is not broad enough or deep enough, or God simply has not revealed the answer to it. And 
Uh, if it's the former, I, try, I will try my best to at least send you down the right path uh, to give you a text that maybe you can examine or maybe some resource that you can turn to to find an answer for it because the answer is knowable. It's just that your host doesn't know the answer. Um, do you? Um, um, but on the second half, if God has not revealed it, then we really need to understand that if God didn't reveal it, it's probably, while it may be an interesting question that we'd love to speculate on, it's probably not overall an important question. Otherwise, God would have revealed it to us or they revealed the answer to us. So uh, those are the parameters. So any Bible question or Alabama football question you have, we'll be glad to, uh, to, to address throughout the program today. Um, I started something yesterday that I'm going to try my best to keep up with. Um, I took um, one of the questions we had yesterday, edited it out of the uh, program that we did, uh, and posted it as a independent video, uh, pre-recorded video on the YouTube channel. Um, and uh, if you didn't see that, I'd like you to go over there and take a look at it. It's it's in the um, uh, list of our you know most recent videos. If you're on the YouTube side. Uh, did that for a couple of reasons, um, several reasons actually, but a couple that I'll mention here. Uh, number one, just um, uh, some of the some of the times we answer these questions. Since I don't know what's coming, I can't put up a a proper um, breakdown of what's in this video. Uh, and I think sometimes the answers that we give, the questions that are asked, the answers that we give, kind of get lost in the shuffle, unless you're Travis and you have a apparently a very detailed breakdown of everything that's talked about on this program. Um, so I wanted to make sure at least a, a couple of those questions gets, um, or that, 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 that they get rather uh, emphasized and have their own place on, on our YouTube channel. So that's part of it. Um, secondly, um, I have been greatly didn't, um, I've been greatly considering um, making this effort that we do here on Digital Bible Study a more YouTube-centric work. Um, for what we do, YouTube is a much better platform than Facebook or any of the others. Um, it's just It just is. Uh, I could go into a probably 15-minute discussion here about why that is, but YouTube is a better streaming platform than Facebook. It reaches a broader audience. It has a broader base than Facebook by far when it comes to live streams and videos. So I want to make sure we we um, have a, uh, a very vibrant uh, YouTube channel if we can. And um, pre-recorded videos of a shorter format often do better on, on YouTube than live streams do. Um, that's not as much the case now as it was maybe a couple of years ago, but it's still the case and it reaches a different audience. So I want to make sure we have some different content there on the YouTube side. So I'm going to be trying my best over the next several weeks, maybe a few months to, uh, emphasize in terms of content development, uh, to emphasize the YouTube channel. So if you are not a, um, a YouTube subscriber to us, YouTube follower for us, um, please consider going over there and doing that. Uh, we have about five times as many people on our Facebook channel as we do on our YouTube channel. And um, I would like to see those numbers e equalize some. So if you happen to be a follower of us on Facebook uh, and you are not a follower of, of us on YouTube, please take a second and go over there and and um, uh, show up. Um Travis is saying that the YouTube YouTube comments are not showing on the screen. I got one from Jenny at 758. And that is the last one I see. They're not popping up in my feed. Um, let me go over here and just uh, take a look at the YouTube side for a second. Um, give me a moment here as I click through this. Um, You are correct. I don't know why those are not showing up on the uh, the Facebook side or on, on the on the restream side. I don't know. That's never happened before. Um, I can see the audience on restream from YouTube, so I've got those numbers. 
But that is correct. The comments on YouTube are not showing up on the uh, on the restream platform. So I doubt I can fix that midstream. So I will do my best to um, keep track of those as we go through the program today. Um, sorry about that, everybody. But that is, well, that's not necessarily something under my control because <laughs> I don't control what Facebook and YouTube and restream and all that do. Uh, I, I don't know why that is. Um, anyway, all right. Um, let's turn our attention. Oh, oh, by the way, before we get to uh, your questions this morning, as I see uh, two or three of those already coming in, uh, we were on yesterday. Uh, some of you have been mentioning you couldn't find us uh, because we were not on at 8 o'clock. Uh, I couldn't be here at 8, and I had promised you after 10 days off or whatever it was, almost two weeks off really, um, that we would be on Monday. But I had some things um, that I had to do Monday morning, uh, primarily unload a trailer and return a trailer to, to U-Haul that kept me out of the office for the first few hours uh, yesterday morning. So we did a, a four o'clock Eastern uh, stream. I put a notice on Facebook. I forgot to put that notice on on YouTube, uh, which by the way, very important. If you're on YouTube, make sure you turn on your notifications. Uh, that's that little bell right below the video. You've got the thumbs up, thumbs down, and you've got a little bell. If you've never clicked the little bell, click the bell. That will turn on notifications for you. And then anytime we go live or post a video indication that we're about to go live, you will hopefully uh, get an email notification that uh, Digital Bible Study is about to go live. Um, as as of the last time I checked, which was a few weeks ago, but it, it's a pretty sta stable number, only about 11% of our YouTube uh, subscribers have the notification bell turned on. So hit that notification bell and that way you'll know if we go, uh, when we go live. But we were on yesterday at four o'clock Eastern. Uh, if you did not see that program, uh, it, it's available of course on the YouTube channel, on Facebook as well. Uh, just to scroll down if on Facebook, scroll down through the pages timeline on YouTube, you should be able to find it in the videos. Uh, I believe it is labeled as episode 1157 uh, of From the Deep End. So um, keep that um, on your plate as well as we go forward from there. So uh, that is there. If you want to go back and, and review it, we welcome you to do it, particularly as you get to the second hour of the program, because we already talked about some things relating to First Peter chapter 4, and uh, I may uh, touch on them a little bit as we start the second hour here in just a bit, but um, I'm not going to go back over the, uh, the whole thing. So anyway, let's turn our attention to your questions this morning. Let's see what I have um, on, start with the Facebook side. Uh, and Jonathan says, I got to meet a representative for Missouri yesterday. Um, is that uh, a state representative or a congressional representative? Which one? But anyway, he said, uh, Johnson says he talked about the Constitution how the, and how fathers need to be active in the home, said a lot of good things. What does the Bible say about the responsibility of the home and especially uh, the responsibility of fathers? Uh, great question, Jonathan. And we probably could take up the, uh, the entire hour answering that question. I know we can. Because last night on Connect, Eric and I spent some time uh, looking through the Ten Commandments and drawing from the Ten Commandments principles that um, need to be instilled in the heart of every child that we um, bring into our homes, bring into our lives. Uh, I think the Ten Commandments is a great starting point for a discussion of spiritual matters. Um, as I said last night in the stream, uh, the reason, well, reason at least it was it was my outline that we used, and so the reason that I went there with Eric was when you think about Israel, you know they had been in Egypt for several hundred years, um, and they had they knew of Jehovah, they knew of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but apparently from Moses' um, re reaction to the to his call there on uh, on the mountain with the burning bush, Israel was not entirely informed about um, their connection to, um, to to their God. And so there was some education that needed to take place. And largely, that's what the Ten Commandments do. The first time that God tried to um, explain himself 
to Israel was in that moment of the giving of the law, and the first thing that he did was to give those 10 principles. So I'm not going to go back and rehearse that because we just did you know an hour on it last night, but I would start there. The responsibility of, of fathers in the home would be to instill in your children the uh, principles that are taught in the Ten Commandments. Uh, and among those things is, is the existence of God, uh, the nature of God, the sovereignty of God, the faithfulness of God, uh, a respect for things that are holy, and then all of the commandments that deal with the respect for others. Um, don't steal from them. Don't, don't Obviously, don't do not kill, do not murder, uh, do not bear false witness. So you respect their life, you respect their reputation, you respect their property. Uh, and the last one there of the Ten Commandments is do not covet. And that... To me, the tenth commandment is a, is a as I said last night in the close. I think it serves as a barometer for how well you're doing the first nine. Because if you are desirous of the possessions, the things, whether it be property or person of of your neighbor, then you have a spiritual problem in yourself. And if you can't complete the tenth commandment, I would suggest going back and looking at the first nine. Because likely you either have a misunderstanding of God or you have a misunderstanding of yourself that somewhere in understanding the first nine commandments, you'll fix yourself. You'll either fix your understanding of God or you will fix your understanding of yourself and then be able to keep the 10th commandment. Now, to your question specifically, Jonathan, about the responsibility of fathers, the Bible is very clear as it discusses the leadership in the home. Um, there is a, a clear delineation of the roles in the home and the person to whom the responsibility for teaching the family about God and his nature is laid squarely upon the shoulders of the father, of the husband. Um, some people have referred to it as the principle of male spiritual leadership. And that is a valid principle to consider when you are thinking about uh, the responsibilities in the home. Um, you know, our society is uh, growing more and more uh, female-centric and female-led. Um, and if you look at all of our pop culture these days, uh, it is, you know, other than Top Gun Maverick and maybe a couple of other movies along the way, um, Every just about every television show, every series you'll come across, most movies, uh, they are female centric and female led these days. Uh, that's not accidental. It is it is an attempt to, to minimize the role of fathers, the role of husbands in the home. But the Bible is clear that the responsibility for leadership in the home is placed upon the man. Uh, there's something interesting I, I, I see in the. Uh, in the uh, opening chapters of the Bible. So let's go ahead and, and, and turn our attention back uh, to Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, um, where we have, where, where is the commandment? Uh, there it is, Genesis 2, 15 through 17. Let's start right there. Go ahead and hide that message from you, Jonathan, so we can see the whole text there. All right, Genesis um, 15, or two, chapter 2, verse 15. The Bible says the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man. So Eve is not here yet. He doesn't say the Lord commanded them. The Bible says the Lord commanded the man. So he is talking here to Adam. He says, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, that's the commandment about the tree that is given. And notice very specifically, it is said that this commandment is not given to Adam and Eve. This commandment is given to Adam. That's where we start. It begins with Adam. Now, starting in verse 18, down through the rest of chapter 2, we have the passage where God creates the woman. The helpmeet, the, the one fit, the one suitable for Adam. 
Okay. So as you go through this, when the commandment about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is given, Eve is not in existence, only Adam. That's why the commandment is given to the man. All right? Scroll down through chapter 2 to the start of chapter 3. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of, the, any other of the beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, to Eve, Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? I believe sometimes we pass by that very quickly. Did God actually say? The only record we have of the biblical text, in the biblical text, of God saying, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If, if this is in any way chronological, Eve is not in existence when that is said. When he says, the serpent says to Eve, did God actually say? What's he doing? What, is, what he is doing is actually driving a wedge between Adam and Eve. Because as the biblical text suggests, Eve never heard that. If Unless there's something that happens after the creation of Eve and is not recorded for us in Genesis 1 and 2, or Genesis 2 rather, um, Eve is not present when God utters those words. Eve's not there. The only person, unless it's from God, and that's not recorded for us in the text, the only person from whom Eve could have heard that message would have been Adam. So the serpent says to Eve, did God actually say this? She wasn't there. She has to trust the word of her husband. All right, very important. Note what follows. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Satan properly re rehearses what God said to Adam. Do not eat of the tree. Look at the next phrase. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. That much is true. That's exactly what God said. You may eat freely of the trees of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So Eve gets the first part right. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the, free, uh, of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. That much is true. Go back up here and look once again uh, in verse number 15. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. Go back down here to chapter 3. You shall not eat of the, God said, this is Eve's report, you shall not eat of the fruit that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it. Excuse me? But God said, neither shall you touch it. There's the commandment right there. Could you please tell me in that text where God says you can't touch the tree? God never said that. As far as the biblical text gives us, God never said you can't touch the tree. <laughs> in the world at this time, there is God. 
there's Adam and there's Eve and I guess the serpent. Serpent didn't say it. From the text, God didn't say it. That leaves two people. Eve believes it to be true, but she didn't originate it, probably. Who's left? As far as I can see, the only person that could have said to Eve, God said, don't touch the tree or you'll die. The only person that I could see, the only person not that I could see, the only person that possibly could say that to Eve would be Adam. And Eve, because she was not present when the commandment was given, only had Adam's word to go on. That's important because the serpent then says, you will not surely die for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and so on. Verse six, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, a delight to the eyes. The tree desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit, she reached up and she touched the tree and pulled the fruit off of it. What she had been told is if you touch it, you'll die. And as far as the biblical text goes, that's not true. I wonder. You know, sometimes in, in, in like a pop culture and, you know, movies, cartoons, whatever, somebody, somebody does something and they expect God to be displeased and they're waiting for the lightning and the thunder to start when they, they do something God doesn't, doesn't approve of, that, that kind of imagery. I wonder if Eve, in her, her um, decision about this, reaches up and, 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 and pauses, you know, if her hand lingers just outside of touching the fruit and then finally her hand touches the fruit. And she's waiting for the thunder to come. And it doesn't. I wonder if that made the next step easier. I wonder if that made the next step easier. I touched it and nothing bad happened. I wonder if the other part of this is also not true. Because I didn't actually hear God say that. My husband did. And he was the one who told me, don't even touch it. And when I touched it, nothing bad happened. Maybe if I eat of it, this serpent is right. I won't surely die. I wonder. I don't know. Can't prove it. I say all that to say this, Jonathan, in answer of your question. Two things, two lessons to draw from this in terms of the responsibility of fathers, or at least two, maybe three as I divide this up in my brain on the fly here. Number one, the fact that God gave this commandment to Adam, to the man, before the creation of the woman emphasizes God's expectation of that male spiritual leadership in the home is essential. God did not reveal this to Eve. God is counting on Adam to direct his family in, the, in following him, in following God. It's on Adam's responsibility to do it, or it's rather the responsibility falls on Adam to do it, not Eve. Now, I know in many homes and in many circumstances, the, the, the women... Uh, the, the mothers of the of the household are in a much better position, uh, sometimes better suited in terms of uh, particularly with young children and, and relating to them and so on. I get it. Uh, I'm, I'm not one of those who buys into the concept that there's no difference between the genders and so on. No, there's a difference. Uh, that There's a reason when a child gets hurt, the child, whether the child's a boy or a girl, uh, and by the way, that's all you can be, either a boy or a girl, um, that child comes running back to mom when he or she gets hurt. There's a reason. 
there, there's a there's a connection there between mother and child that that uh, that's a different connection than a father has. All right, so I get it. There are going to be a lot of times when when the mothers of the family spend a lot of time dealing with the um, the, the day in day out um, uh, uh, development of a child. I got it. God's expectation is the director of all of that, and the one to whom the responsibility has been given falls upon the husband. So you ask, what is the responsibility of in the home, especially of fathers? It's that. If you if you are going to take upon yourself the responsibility of having a wife and then having children, you are pledging to God that I will I will raise my house in a spiritual manner. Anything less than you have failed your responsibility. It's not her job. It's your job. All right? Uh, because I, I'll tell you, the, 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 um, my experience has been, uh, my observation has been over the 30 years of ministry that I've done, uh, that, you know, women often show up to worship without their husbands. You know what I've almost never seen? I mean, I've seen it occasionally, but it's rare. You know what I've almost never seen? A husband that comes to worship, participates in the church activities without his wife or his children being there. Yes, I've seen it, but it's almost as rare as hen's teeth, as they as they say in Mississippi. It's rare. The other direction where the wife shows up with the children and the husband doesn't, oh, I see that all the time. But when the man takes his responsibility of spiritual leadership in the home seriously, the family almost always falls in line. Almost always. All right? God put it that way on purpose. Point number two on this. Sometimes, in the attempt to save our families and to protect our families, we can actually end up doing harm. God said, don't eat of that tree. Okay, that's sufficient in the mind of God. I can't prove this because the text doesn't say. But I, I have met one or two men, and, and I am one myself. And sometimes when we get it in our brain that something's not going to happen in our family, we will go to the extreme. Hey, if God said, don't eat of that tree, listen. In our house, we're not, not, not only are we not going to eat of it, we're not going to touch it. We're, we're not going to get anywhere near it. We're not going to come within 10 feet of it, okay? And, and, and so what we do is in the name of, if we're talking about spiritual matters, in the name of God, we will actually put up fences and barriers that he never created. Last night, as Eric and I were talking about the Ten Commandments and, and and the principles that need to be instilled in the heart of God, in the heart of children, one of the commandments, of course, is honor your father and mother, that you again may that it may be well with you, and that you may live long in the land which God has promised to you. Okay, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land. That that is a statement of generational succession, generational succession of people that have no other gods before God, that do not take the name of the Lord God in vain, and so on. And what happens then is that the promises of God, that you will dwell long in the promised land, are are, are, are demonstrated to be faithful. Part of the responsibility of parents, particularly fathers, in raising up children is to make sure that a proper understanding, a proper image of God is created. Uh, I think Eric made a great point last night in the stream where he said, um, you know, make sure you aren't promising things to your children that God has not promised. We do that all the time, you know, about, you know, physical sickness. There, there's, there's not a promise in the New Testament under the gospel. Now, there, there are some promises in the Old Testament about none of the diseases of Egypt and that kind of thing, but there are no promises in the gospel that you won't get sick if you follow Jesus, all right? There's no, there are no promises that if you pray really hard, God will make you better. Uh, in fact, the promise is the other direction. It's appointed unto man wants to die. Sooner or later, cancer or age or whatever is going to get you. It's going to get us all. 
God never promised that we won't die. Not not in, in terms of literal. Obviously, there's the spiritual connection there. The man believes in me, he shall never die, John chapter 11. But God never promised that our bodies won't die. Never promised that. So don't tell your children that. Don't tell them something that God promised that they didn't. On the other hand, don't do what apparently Adam did here and take away God's liberties either. You know, they were told, Adam was specifically, the Lord God put, took the man and put him in the garden to work it and to keep it. Meaning, I'm assuming, if you're working and keeping a garden, what do you do? You prune plants, you you you, you pick up the clippings as 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 fruit um um uh, goes in season, out of season, you know, fruit drops to the ground and, and so on. Uh, I'm assuming part of that process would be to clean up the garden as, as a garden grows. Why would that not include the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Did it not need, did it not need to be worked and kept either? In order to fulfill the responsibility of working and keeping the garden, it might be, it might very well be possible that Adam and Eve would need to touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it's part of the garden that they need to work and to keep. So the first command that they're given to work and to keep the garden very likely included the necessity of pruning, of trimming, or, or, or whatever, of working and keeping the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So this commandment, unless there's something I just that's not unless there's something that's not revealed to us, this first commandment necessitates that they touch the tree. But Eve somehow has it in her brain we shouldn't even touch it. Again. I only know of one person who could have told her that. Sometimes in trying to keep our family safe, we effectively use God as a weapon. And in so doing, we strip away liberty, we strip away the promises of God from our people. You can't do either. You cannot diminish the authority of God in the home, nor can you, uh, uh, well, three things, I guess. You can't diminish his authority. You can't make promises to your family that God never made because if you can't keep them if God's not behind them. Don't try to cash a check on God's account that he never, that he never wrote. But on the other hand, make sure in the desire to protect the family, you don't give your family and your, particularly your children a distorted image of the God that they're serving. He's not, he, 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 he is not the, the, the switch on the peach tree that, uh, that, that you need to have out in the backyard to threaten the children with when their time comes, that that's not the role that God plays for them. Let them experience the blessings and the liberties of God. All right, now that's kind of a high-level answer to your question, Jonathan, but at least I hope it helps at least um, at least some. Um, got a couple of follow-ups there. Uh, Kyle just put one in a second ago. Um, let's see what Kyle's got to say. Following this line of thought, would this imply that Adam lied to Eve prior to her touching of the fruit? She tells the serpent, but God said... Um, that's a good question, Kyle. One, I, one I've never actually thought about. Uh, it cuts it off there. The the little buffer is not big enough on the bottom. So let me um, uh, read the read the following. Would this lie then be considered a sin, given that there's no law from God? Yet Adam, uh, yet for her, yet for Adam not to lie. If so, this helps justify Romans five twelve that act at, that as Adam actually excuse me, I'm having trouble reading apparently. As uh, if so, this helps justify Romans five twelve uh, through fourteen as Adam actually having sinned first. Um, good thought, Kyle. Um, I, 
I do think because that is interesting. You're you're right in your construction of it. Romans five does attribute the sin to Adam, uh, and that is clear. But as you read the text, obviously, it is Eve that uh, takes the fruit and eats of it before Adam. And then, as many has as many have pointed out in the past, she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. So that seems to indicate that while this discussion of the fruit is going on, um, Adam was there and did not speak up. First Timothy 2 also says about Eve that uh, part of the problem that she had was that she was deceived. The implication is that Adam was not. So Adam was willful in his eating of the fruit. He was not deceived, and part of the reason I think he's not deceived, and this is an I think moment, is because he knows the answer to that question. Did God actually say? Adam was there. I mean, that's what it says. The Lord took the man, and the Lord commanded the man. Adam was there. He he doesn't, this question doesn't work on Adam because Adam was there. He knows exactly what God said. Question doesn't work on Adam unless Adam already wants the fruit. And this is just, you know, Kyle, this is Jonathan 101 here. Completely Jonathan 101. I I can't read this anywhere in the text. I'm just trying to put myself into that situation. Um, Adam's law. Let me just call it Adam's law. Not only are we not going to eat of it, we're not going to touch it. All of us have things that that we crave. Cookies, ice cream, chips, alcohol, whatever. We all all have things that we crave. And sometimes when we try to correct our abuse of those things, we do the cold turkey approach, right? I'm not going to eat those chips anymore. I'm not, I'm not, it's not that I'm going to moderate the number of chips that I eat. No more. I'm not going to eat anything. And we say that because deep down, you know what we really want? We really want the chips. And so not only am I not going to have, I'm not, I'm not, am I not going to eat them? They're not even going to be in the house. When I go to the grocery store, I'm not even going to look at them. Right? That's what we do. Because we have our own desires here, we create barriers that were never necessary in terms of not eating those chips or drinking that drink or whatever the case may be. So we do that to protect ourselves. So completely Jonathan 101 here, Kyle, in response to your question, um, I think Adam's in on this. And in that sense, the failure belongs to him. Yes, Eve ate the fruit first. She did. But Adam seems in, seems to me, Adam is complicit in the sin and responsible for the actions of his family. He's the spiritual head, the spiritual leader, the one who is to make sure that this commandment is fulfilled. The problem is he wants the fruit too. That's the problem. And when Eve gives him the fruit with, and he was with her, it doesn't seem like he objects. Because now that she's done it, I can do it. That's my take. So yeah, uh, I you know I think Kyle, I think your post is probably maybe overthinking it a bit uh, in in terms of the sequencing here because I don't know that we're 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 necessarily dealing with a a sequencing thing. I mean, I get it. You're a coder, and I have some of that in my background, and, and we try to do that. So I'm not blaming you on that, but that's what we do. But I think we're dealing here with a big uh, – Romans 5 is dealing with a bigger picture. The responsibility for not having that fruit eaten belongs to Adam, not Eve. She was deceived. He was not. And so the whole episode is laid at the feet of Adam. And on some level, whether it's a a a a modification, 
let me just, to be nice, call it a modification of God's law, an addition to God's law, whether that be, you want to call it a lie to Eve, whether that be not standing up and defending his wife against the serpent. I mean, you could probably attribute four or five sins at the feet of Adam that led to Eve eating the fruit. But the overarching point is going to be that however however you want to, you know, put the chronology and the sequence down, the overarching problem is this is this this needs to be laid at the feet of Adam, not Eve. Okay. Um, now she's guilty of her own sin, yes. But ultimately that sin goes to him first. Um let's see what we have here. Uh da, 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 da. okay, what what else do we have? Um but I appreciate the question, Jonathan. Great great thoughts and, and I hope um that discussion at least uh, gives you something to think about a little bit. Um, still don't see it. Let me turn up the, pull up the YouTube. I, I haven't seen any of the YouTube comments. Got a lot of stuff going on there, I'm sure. Um, let's see. Um, give me a second. I got to read through these just, um, um, Yep. Okay. Well, we got, Travis got a question about Ezekiel 16. I'm going to ignore that for a moment because Ezekiel 16 is hard. <laughs> so ask it again tomorrow, Travis. <laughs> I don't want to deal with a hard question like that. <laughs> All right. Let's see what we have here from uh, Connie, I believe it is. Connie says, I saw a post from a person who thinks you would be good if you baptized yourself if no one else is a, was around. I don't agree with that. Your thoughts. Um, interesting thought, Connie. The Bible, as far as I can tell, does not address the possibility uh, of that happening. Um, and in terms of the actual text, I don't. We, obviously, we can't go to every statement of of this in the Bible. But start in Act, excuse me, Acts two and verse number thirty eight. Acts 2 and verse 38, the Bible says, repent and be baptized, all right? Um, that is translated in the English as being in the passive voice. In grammar, English and Greek, um, there are voices that go along with verbs. An active voice is when the subject of the sentence is is taking the action. So I, or let me just, since Connie, you asked the question, I'll say Connie kicked the ball. That's active voice. Connie is the subject. The verb is kicked. The object is ball. The subject takes the action upon the object. That's the active voice. Uh, in both Greek and in English, there is also a passive voice voice. And so in this sentence, you would say the ball was kicked by Connie. So now the ball being the subject was kicked. That's passive. So the object by Connie, the object of the prepositional phrase at the end of the sentence by Connie. So the object takes the action upon the subject. So active voice, passive voice. Uh, in Greek, there's also a middle voice, uh, which we don't we, we kind of have it in English, but not not strictly in English. Um, and uh, the the middle voice is would be something along the lines of the ball kicked itself would be the best English parallel to it. Uh, it's it doesn't doesn't transfer as easily to English as it does in, in the Greek. But there is a middle voice, and that's what it is. It's 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 in between the passive and the active. Doesn't, the middle voice doesn't matter for this discussion. When you come across the concept of baptism and the commandment to be baptized, it is, I think, every time in the passive voice. So repent is, um, in the Greek, in Acts 2.38, the re repent is an aorist active imperative. So it is a command. It's an imperative. It's an aorist, which suggests that there is a, a singular one-time action that must be done. 
uh, usually translated in the past tense, but here in, it's, it's here it's essentially translated in the present because it's leading up to this idea that you're going to be baptized and then receive the forgiveness of sins. So it's looking forward to the completion of the activity. But repent is in the active. So I can't repent for you. You have to repent yourself. It is something that you must do. Connie repented. All right. That's an active voice. You have to do it. Be baptized is in the passive voice, meaning that it is an action that you that is done to you. All right. Uh, like I said, we don't have time to go through all of them, but let's go to um, how about Acts twenty Acts twenty two sixteen is a good one. Acts twenty two sixteen, as uh, uh, Ananias comes to Saul. And verse 15 says, you will be a witness for him of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Here it is. Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. All right. So rise is again an erect, an aorist active. This time it's a participle. But then we have a, a, uh, a, a and actually it, it's translated in the passive, but this is actually a, uh, an aorist middle imperative. So there's that middle voice, all right? In other words, Saul has to make the choice and an and, and, and action of his, of his will to be baptized, but he's going to have to have another component there. Obviously, Ananias is the one that's going to do it. So you'll never have a, a baptism talked about as an active uh, responsibility. It's always a passive responsibility. It is something that is done to you. You submit to baptism. So in that regard, Connie, I'm going to agree with you. Uh, I can't find a biblical example where um, uh, where a person baptized themselves. And from a grammatical standpoint, as you look at the text, I can't find a basis upon which somebody uh, should be able to um, uh, uh, baptize themselves. It's always something that is done to the person. It is an act of submission that takes place. So in principle, Connie, I would agree with you. Um, however, well, look at there. A YouTube post just showed up in the uh, um, on, on the uh, on the on the chat. I don't know why. After all this time, a YouTube post just showed up, but there it is. But uh, l l let me deal with maybe a hypothetical here for you just a moment, Connie. If I were in a situation where I had been studying the Bible by myself um, and came to the conclusion that I needed to be baptized and I couldn't find somebody to baptize me, you know what I'd do? I would baptize myself. Uh, it may not be right it may not be what the text says, but at least in that moment, and I know I need to do it, if I couldn't find somebody to do it, I would do it anyway and throw myself before the throne of God saying, please accept it, because that's what, that's what I would do. Now, would I teach that as a matter of doctrine? Of course not, because for the reasons we just gave, but um, uh, that's what I would do. I would also add, though, and this is important, I can't find anywhere in the text where it says anything about the administrator of baptism. I can find all kinds of things about the person who is going to be baptized. Acts chapter 8, what hinders me from being baptized? Simon says to the eunuch, to the Ethiopian, um, you know, if you believe, you can. The prerequisite of baptism, it says nothing about the person who's doing the baptizing. The, the, the pre, preconditions that need to be met would be belief and repentance. The eunuch's told to believe, and then you can be baptized. They're told in Acts chapter 2, repent, and you can be baptized. So put those two things together. You need to believe in Jesus, and you need to be, you need to be willing to change your life in repentance before you can be baptized. Those two things are true. Nothing about the person who actually performs the baptism. So the simplest way around the problem would be just to find somebody who would agree to baptize you. 
So unless you're like on a deserted island by yourself in one of those, you know, strange hypothetical situations that sometimes people uh, uh, turn to to either, you know, make a point or overturn a point. Uh, I, I mean, I suppose that's possible. Somebody, somebody could be by themselves and, and come to that conclusion and not have another soul around uh, and, and need to be baptized. Like, I guess that's possible. But in nearly every single instance of life, um, there are other people around. And I can't find anything in the text that says anything about that person who does the baptism. I mean, that would be horrible, wouldn't it? If the person who was doing the baptizing had to be somehow uh, ordained or, or sanctified by God in order to perform the baptism, um, because you don't know. What if the person baptizing you professes to be a Christian, but is ultimately a hypocrite and is not saved? By every appearance, they are, but you don't know that because you can't read the hearts of people. And so you go to this preacher or this Christian to baptize you, and really what this person is is, is a heretic and a hypocrite, and you don't know it, and they baptize you. If that person's spiritual condition matters to sanctify your baptism, you would be baptized by somebody that invalidated your baptism and would never know it, you would go to the throne of God having been baptized by somebody who invalidated your baptism. That'd be a bad thing. See, I don't think it can. From, from, a, from, a, uh, a, in a, from a practical standpoint, the person's, person who is doing the baptism, their spiritual condition can have no bearing on the validity, validity of your own baptism. Otherwise, you run into all kinds of problems we would have to know things about the person doing the baptizing that we can't know. You know, it's not like the, the Renaissance art where, where the, the saints had a little halo or a little glow around their back, you know, their head so that you knew this was a good person. That doesn't happen in our world. We don't see it. We don't know it. So you wouldn't know. So as far as I can tell from the text and from just thinking this thing through, I can't see anything in the text that requires any special spiritual qualifications of the person doing the baptizing. Um, and so if I were in that situation, if I were in that situation, I would go ahead and find somebody, even if they're not a believer in God, I would find somebody who would baptize me for the remission of my sins. Uh, and that's how I would solve the problem. So a great question though, Connie, uh, it's, it's a, um, um, kind of kind of an important ty type discussion. Um, let's, let's see. We got got a couple of follow ups follow ups here. Um, you know, De Deborah says the same thing. Um, uh, if I were stuck somewhere with no one around to do it, I'd take chances and do it myself. That's just what I said. I would do exactly the same thing on that. Uh, Connie comes back and says the Ethiopian confessed his belief in that that Christ is the Son of God. That seems to be a point of uh, 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 seems to be a point of baptism is confession that Christ is the Son of God. If you baptize yourself, who do you confess to? Again, valid point, Connie. You, you, if 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 you're by yourself, who could you confess your 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 faith to? Um, I, the the well, boy that opens up another. It's eight fifty eight. I need to I need to wrap this up. We do take so, somewhat of a formulaic confession of faith before we baptize people in public. We do that. When you look at Romans 10, confession is made into salvation with the mouth. Confession is made into salvation. Um, uh, Matthew chapter 10, uh, the one that denies me versus the one that confesses me. I, I don't know that, that either one of those passages is looking at a single act right before your baptism. Uh, the concept of confession to me in Scripture is broader than that. It's not only a confession of faith at the beginning of faith. There is a continual confession of faith for the entirety of the life. So if that confession of faith is made, uh, you know, obviously they're, they're, they're you know, I, I moved here to Rockledge three years ago and the vast majority of people that attend every Sunday, I never heard them confess their faith before they were baptized. Now I have heard them confess their faith for the last three years. Um, so I, I, I don't know that to boil Acts 8 or, or Romans 10, Roman Matthew 8 down to a specific formula that needs to be said before baptism is, is ultimately the point. I, I think that's probably a little broader and involves not just a confession before baptism, but a 
and living of that confession throughout all the days of life. Uh, so I would broaden that some, but your point's well taken uh, because that is a complication that you'd have to address. And that's why, you know, as we said, as I said earlier, and, and I think it was Deborah said, yeah, if I were stuck in that condition, I'd baptize myself too. If I did that, you know what I would do? Uh, the moment that I could rectify that, I would go ahead and quote unquote, be baptized again. Because what, what if baptizing yourself is an invalid baptism, and now six months later, I'm with fellow Christians and I have people that are willing to baptize me, what, 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 should, you, what should you do? Well, you should probably make that confession of faith again, and then you should probably be baptized, because then you know. Then you're 100% certain. Uh, and if you didn't need it, so what? You just got wet the second time. It doesn't doesn't change anything. So uh, and from there, real quick here, um, maybe we need to talk about some of this tomorrow because all of a sudden I'm getting several questions about baptism. Jonathan says, what if someone is allergic to water? Aquagena, your Korea? Okay. I don't know about allergic to water, Jonathan. I did have somebody who was um, absolutely fearful of water. Uh, that I baptized back when I was in Mississippi. This was early in my preaching career. He had had some kind of injury when he was young, and it messed up his ears. I mean, his, it, it looked like he was a boxer. You know how the boxers get kind of get those clubbed ears? Uh, but it was kind of a cross between uh, uh, that, that, that cauliflower ear that a boxer gets or and a burn victim, where sometimes the, the skin kind of fuses together. It was weird. It wasn't a burning, but somehow his ears were were – connected they were kind of fused to his head but had that you know that cauliflower look that sometimes boxers and and, and MMA, MMA people get um and it happened in his childhood and ever since then he is he was always deathly afraid of ever putting his head all the way underwater and I promise you he, he wanted to be baptized and I promise you we spent four hours on a Saturday four hours in the baptistry I tried every position I could think of, taking him backwards, taking him forward, uh, uh, having him kneel down and sit. And every time we would start to go whichever way to, to immerse him, he would just pull up and, and, not, and would not go under the water. Four hours. And finally, got him laying down, kind of on you know, the steps leading down in the baptistry, got him laying down on the steps with his hands, you know, by, like the second step down, kind of doing a, uh, an incline bench press or an incline push up on the steps with his face basically touching the water. And he did like a count of three or whatever it was. And actually, I wasn't ready because <laughs> we've been in there for four hours. We've tried this over and over and over again. And all of a sudden, he went down. And so as quickly as I could, I got my hand on the back of my hand on the back of him to say, Yeah, I did it. I, I, I baptized him. <laughs> So I think I actually touched him while he was under the water. I don't know if it mattered or not. We counted it, and I'm hopeful God did too. But we counted that thing after four hours. He went all the way under, and I think my hand was touching him at some point because I think that must that must matter if I'm baptizing them. I have to be in contact with them, right? I mean, the Bible doesn't actually say that, but that's, that's what we – so I gave him a thumbs up, and we took it, and, and we called it a win and went home that day. Uh, so – that's what we did. Uh, so yeah, there, there are all kind of difficulties in getting people baptized. It is amazing. Uh, and so if you're ever doing a baptism, you need to make sure before you bat take somebody down in the water, are you afraid of the water? Do you have any allergies? Do you have any back problems, any knee problems, anything? You've got to find that out before you try to baptize them. Otherwise, weird stuff can happen when you're baptizing people. Um, so Jonathan, you know, to your, to your, to your question there about uh, allergies to water and so on, um, you know, it's it's kind of like in my mind the same thing you're dealing with. We're commanded to sing, um, and 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 the you know the, the the fruit of our lips in praise to God. Well, what if somebody's mute? What if somebody has an injury and can't? Um, you know, what what if somebody's deaf and they can't actually sing because they've never heard singing? Okay, you, you start going with all of the exceptions to the rule. They don't invalidate the rule, all right? And and I think you know God is sovereign. And God is able to, to count faith as righteousness and, and can do a lot of things. And I, um, I'll leave all of these kind of hypothetical situations, I'll leave them in the hand of God to deal with himself um, and, and trust in his mercy, his grace, and his sovereignty to do what's right by people. Um, 
but that doesn't change what I can teach about the law of God. If God's sovereignty and his mercy can supersede the letter of his law from time to time, that's great. He's God. He can do it. I will not argue with him. If somebody ends up in heaven with a baptism that I don't that I, that I wouldn't have understood, if they end up in heaven because of it, that's great. I'll give him praise and thank the Lord that that soul is saved. That doesn't allow me then to change what the text says. That's two separate issues. The text says repent and be baptized. And that's what I'm going to preach, regardless of whether I'm by myself, whether the person baptizing me is a Christian or not, whether I have fear of allergies of water, whatever. Uh, you know, sometimes that hypothetical people bring up, well, what about the man who's out in the desert and can't find water? Okay, you, you bring up all the examples and all the reasons somebody can't be baptized, and you still have not dealt with the actual argument from the text. The text says, the text still says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Nothing you say is going to change the answer to that. So anyway, lots of good questions. Thank you for the participation this morning. Um, we will take a short break here. I'm already, I'm long, already past the top of the hour, but we will take a short break here. Let me kind of reset the room and uh, refill my, my drink cup here. And we will be back in about three or four minutes to continue uh, uh, this program specifically with our look at First Peter chapter four and uh, verse uh, verse number seven. So uh, sit tight. Be right back with you here in just a couple of, a couple of moments.
All right, everybody. Welcome back here to uh, From the Deep End. Uh, we're going to turn our attention now in the uh, second hour of the program here uh, to our study of the book of 1 Peter. We are in chap- 1 Peter chapter 4. Um, I understand several of y'all missed the program yesterday. Um, we uh, did an afternoon program because I was unavailable in the morning, and it had just been way too long since we were on. So I said, I'm going to go ahead and do a show in the afternoon. And we did it. Audience was down, audience size was down a little bit because it came on when y'all weren't expecting. And uh, so uh, I would encourage you to find that on Facebook or on YouTube. I would encourage you to go back and find that lesson. Uh, and for our, our purposes right now, especially, uh, go back and watch the um, second hour of the program. I did a lot of um, review for about the first 30 minutes of that second hour because it had been two weeks since we had talked about the book. I just wanted to make sure we were kind of all on the same page together. Uh, so a lot of review in that one. And then we spent about 30 minutes uh, looking at some things in 1 Peter 4, 7. Uh, some of that we'll cover again today, just because I know the audience was down and we're going to go back over it. But uh, there are going to be things in that session that we talked about that we will not repeat today. So uh, a lot of it will be review. Some of it will be repeated today, but there will be points that... If you're interested in the study of this verse, uh, there were points that were made yesterday that will not be made today, uh, and so you probably want to go back and and uh, uh, and catch those just because uh, I think this is, uh, while the first half of the verse, the first statement of the verse is very simple, I believe it is a very impactful, important verse in all of the New Testament. Um uh, it, it it states a truth that needs to be explained, and it needs to be explained within a first century context. I'm not one of these. If, if you've been with me at all in the study of the Bible, as we study through Romans, and some of the other texts that we've been through here on the, what are we, 158, I think, episodes of, of, of From the Deep End now, um, I there are um, there are not a lot of times where I take statements like this in the New Testament that seem to be very specific, declarative of something, and then make a general application of them. See, that, that's the, that's the, the, the common practice of a lot of modern teachers and um, uh, commentators. And part of the problem I believe they have is one of two things. They are either, well, it, it's, it's really two parts of the same thing. On some level, they are they are futurist, um, either partial futurist or full futurist. Full futurist being premillennialist and so on. Um, you know, for for your traditional evangelical American Christian, most of those are some variation of of premillennial in their thinking. And for them, of course, that means that the thousand-year reign of Jesus is yet in the future. So there, there's that concept of being a futurist. Those things are yet in the future. Um, and because of that, a statement like this in 1 Peter 4, 7 is problematic if you take it literally and apply it to the first century. Because the, the moment you say in the, as a specific application in the first century that the end of all things is at hand, you have to explain that. The end of what? You know, all things of what? All things in general? All things within a within the scope of something relating to the revelation? All things how? You have to explain it. And the moment you explain it, you cease to be a futurist. Because if you if you explain it in a first century setting, you are at least a partial preterist meaning that you believe this prophecy has already been fulfilled. It's in the past. It's, it's, a, it's pre. It's preterist. It's not future. It's in the past. Those are your options. You can be a preterist or a futurist or some blend of the two. Partial preterist is also a partial futurist. Those are your two options. And for premillennial theology, you essentially have to be a full futurist because the moment you start picking off individual prophecies and say, now, wait a minute, this one was fulfilled in the in, in the first century. This was fulfilled maybe in the Old Testament. You fulfill it at any point in the past. Okay, if if even a part of that was fulfilled in the past, and this is some things we won't go back to that we rehearsed yesterday, but you're going to have to look at Daniel 9 in the sealing up of the vision and the prophet 
during the time of the 70 weeks. You're going to have to look at maybe Daniel 7 and the and the glorification of the saints at the end of Daniel 7, the glorification and the giving of the kingdom to the one like the Son of Man in what Daniel 7, 13, 7, 14. Uh, you're going to have to look at the end of all of these things in Daniel 12, or the, the end will come, Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation, Matthew what, 24, 14, and 15, somewhere in that range. You're going to have to start addressing those texts. And the problem is, once you start pulling on one thread, the way that the Bible interweaves itself and, and layers itself with these prophecies, the moment you start pulling on one thread, you're going to undermine the entirety of premillennial theology if you take this single statement and make it a first century statement. But if you don't make it a first century statement, you've got another problem. And that problem is, well, what does it mean then? What does it mean? And the only way you can get around it is to say that what it means is generic. That this fiery trial that has come upon them, that's here in first chapter, first Peter chapter four and verse number twelve. That the the grievous trials that are mentioned all the way back up here in chapter one. Um, chapter one and uh, uh, where is that? Verse five, six. Where is that? Verse six. In in this, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved with various trials. What you're going to have to say is, those trials are are temporary, transient, personal. And so it's necessary in every age for every Christian that various trials will come, that a fiery trial shouldn't surprise you when it comes upon you to test you because that happens to every Christian throughout all ages and throughout all time. That's what you have to do with it. I got, there's a problem with that, though. It's not true. I mean, it's not, it's, it, well, there's a textual problem that I'll get to in just a moment, but the ultimate problem is not a textual problem. The ultimate problem is an anecdotal or experiential problem. Um, if you have been a child of God living in the United States for the last, well, essentially for the history of the United States, could you please tell me? What fiery trial you've been through? Could you identify for me the fiery trial that an American Christian has been through in the last 200 years? And not just a fiery trial that some or a single Christian has been through. To generalize this text, to say that the fiery trial applies to everybody guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to say that it happens to everyone because chapter 10, or I did that yesterday too. I don't know why. It's verse 10. But the last three or four times I've tried to reference this passage, I've started by saying chapter 10. And in no Bible that I've ever read are there 10 chapters in 1 Peter. There are five chapters in 1 Peter, but I'm looking for the 10th verse of 1 Peter. After you have suffered, here, there's that little while statement again. Uh, oh, excuse me, it's verse 9. Verse 10 is the little while statement. Ver verse 9 is the one I want. Resist him firm in the faith, talking about the devil, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So if you're going to generalize this text, the text says it's necessary that various trials come. The fiery trial has come upon you, and it's not strange, and it's happening to all of your brothers throughout the world. In other words, in order for this to be true, it has to be true for everyone. It's necessary, chapter 1. It's not strange, chapter 4. Don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial that has come upon you. And it happens to everyone, just as Paul would say in um, uh, 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 2 Timothy 3, uh, that all that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Okay, If you're going to apply that generally, the statements are universal. Not that it occasionally happens to somebody, 
Not that because you're a Christian, the possibility exists that maybe you'll go through a fiery trial of persecution. It happens to every single person. That's the demand of the text, if you generalize the statement. And so I ask again, what fiery trial, based upon your faith, have you been through? I'll just speak for me. I've never been through a fiery trial based upon my faith. Oh, I've had hardship in life. I've had hardship in life. I've suffered loss. Julie and I have had good times and eh, some not so good times, particularly in the first several years of our marriage. Um, I've had random events happen. House flooded during Harvey. That stunk. I would, I would, you know, Hurricane Harvey hit Houston, uh, and uh, my house was about 100 yards. I mean, literally, like 100 yards inside the 100-year floodplain in, on the west side of Houston, um, and it flooded. That's what happens when you buy a house that's inside the floodplain. It floods when a hurricane comes through. I'm going to tell you that sucked. Don't do that. Uh, the check I got at the end of the day was nice. That was enjoyable. I love the check. Uh, that's why I now have a beachfront condo, because I got a really nice check from the insurance company. Thankfully, I had flood insurance. But I had to have flood insurance because I bought a house that was inside the floodplain. Uh, that, that's funny. It's funny how the bank makes you do that. Okay? But the actual experience of it stunk. Don't, don't experience that. Uh, don't. Um, but you know what else happened? Julie and I are members of the Lord's Church. We're Christians. But we didn't suffer because of our faith. There were a whole lot of people up and out, up and down our neighborhood, and throughout the I think around one hundred thousand houses that flooded during Harvey in Houston. A good, a very good percentage of those, maybe even the majority of them, I don't know, were not Christians or made no profession of faith at all, and their houses flooded too because the rain falls upon the just and the unjust. That is not a fiery trial based upon my faith that test the genuineness of my faith. That's life. That's life. Now, the end result of that, as I just said, is that we moved back to Florida, and I wake up every morning to the sun rising over the beach, over the ocean. Boy, I just am not being persecuted because of my faith. I've never experienced what this is talking about. Various grievous trials, a fiery trial that's happening to the brotherhood throughout the world. And I suspect, I suspect you haven't either. Oh, maybe at work somebody made fun of you for your, for your, for, for your faith or something of that nature. But what's being talked about in this book no. Now, maybe, based upon the direction of our nation, maybe American Christians very soon, we will be suffering like that because of our faith. Because surely there have been pockets of people throughout the world who have, throughout all of history. Absolutely true. But that doesn't suffice to cover this text this text is everybody. Everybody in the brotherhood. The time has come that judgment begins at the house of God. Nobody is exempt from this. Everybody's catching it. You cannot generalize this text and bring it forward into a 21st century, particularly American, context. You simply can't. I, Listen, you, you can't even apply this to, say, Christians that are living, say, in Ukraine right now. You can't. They're not suffering. I mean, they, they are suffering. Clearly, they're suffering. Their nation is being, it's, it's going through conflicts, going through war. But they're not suffering because they're Christians. They're suffering because the country to their east has a really strong military. And Ukraine serves as a buffer between 
the old uh, 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 communist Eastern Bloc and NATO. And also, oh, by the way, there's a whole bunch of uh, natural resources and natural gas and oil and other things in Ukraine that maybe that aggressive country to the east wants. That has nothing to do with Jesus. It has nothing to do with faith. Oh, now, if you're a Christian, you're caught up in it and you're going through a fiery trial, but it is not a fiery trial about judgment beginning at the house of God. So that's what we do. We take texts like this and we try to generalize it and apply it to everybody. And if you stop and you think it through, that generalized application fails every time, every single time. So you can't come to 1 Peter 4 and verse number 7 and say what Peter is talking about here is that their own personal suffering is soon going to come to an end. So that the that the end of all things here is all things relating to your personal problems that you're going through. And if you just persevere, your own personal suffering is going to end. That's not what he's talking about. He is talking about a necessary, universal, fiery trial that is going to be that's going to come to a consummation, that's going to come to a, a finality soon. It's at hand. Now, going back to chapter 1, the opening of this book. This book is written to elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. If we were to pull up a Bible map right now and look at, actually, I think we can. Can we do that? Give me just a second here. No, really? Give me a second here. Give me just a second here. All right, that has most of them on there. If I pull that up and put that over here, does it work? Let's see if I've got the right thing on the screen that I think I've got. Okay. Now, let me zoom in a little bit so maybe y'all can see it a little bit better. Okay. It doesn't have all of them on here, but this map has several of them. So we are writing to the saints in... Cappadocia, which is over here on the eastern side of, of the map. Let me scroll that a little bit better. So on this map, we are dealing with, um, uh, here's the Mediterranean Sea. There, of course, is the northern portions of the Promised Land. Uh, you can see Israel there. You go up the coast to Cappadocia. Galatia is not mentioned, or not labeled, rather, but Galatia would be down here in this region. And then you have Bithynia, uh, you have Pamphylia down here, Phrygia, some of those regions, Bithynia and Pontus would be up here. And to the west portion of what would now be modern-day Turkey, you have Asia, which would then include all of those seven churches of Asia, which are primarily down here in this region in southwest Asia, Asia Minor, that are in the book of, in the book of, the bo book of Revelation. The reason I bring that up is, they're obviously included here, the saints in the churches of Asia. Now, is there some book, and obviously I just mentioned it, but is there some book which describes for saints in that general region? And the reason I pull that up is obviously Asia, the seven churches of Asia are going to be in the, the book of Revelation. But the regions of Pontus, Galatia, and Bithynia, and Cappadocia are all congruent to Asia. It's all in that same region, all right? So is there a, obviously the book of Revelation describes a tribulation, a necessary trial that is going to test the genuineness of people's faith, and it is necessary 
for it to happen. And it is necessary, as the book of Revelation says, because things are about to, or, or shortly will come to pass. The Hebrews writer, the, the first Peter says, or, or Peter says, it's going to happen for a little while. In other words, it's shortly going to come to pass. Now, in the book of Revelation, we see these tribulations, and whom are they affecting? They are affecting the saints. Just as Peter says, the same kinds of, 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 of sufferings are happening by the brotherhood throughout the world. Hmm. It's a fiery trial that not only happens to all of the brethren, the brethren rather, but it begins at the household of God. Have you read the book of Revelation? Have you read Daniel 7 that talks about the little horn who will make war with the saints of the Most High, the people of the Most High? Yeah, as I, as I say often when we study together, the Bible is not trying to trick you. It is trying to explain itself to you, right? It's trying to help you understand it. This fiery trial of First Peter is the same fiery trial of Revelation. It's the same tribulation of Matthew 24 of Mark 13, of Luke 21, Luke 17. It's all the same. It's not talking about seven different things. It's not some generalized thought. We are dealing here with the end of all things relating to prophecy. Relating to, not just prophecy, it's a bad way of stating it. Relating to the mystery of God, the completion of the mystery of God. Now, that mystery of God is not the totality of biblical prophecy. That's important because, as we talked earlier in the opening, there are those who are full futurist, diehard dispensational premillennialist. There are also those who are full preterist, who believe that every prophecy of the Bible has already been fulfilled and would tie 1 Peter 4, 7 to every prophecy to everything said, and I would have I would have some dispute of that. But th th that's the doctrine we've talked about it as we study through Romans and other things of uh, covenant eschatology, realized eschatology, whatever the, the current name for it is, um, more pejoratively simply known as the AD 70 doctrine, all right? They would say that every single prophecy of the Bible has already been fulfilled, and about that, or, or to that I would argue, or about which I would argue. Um, but this is relating, this is the same thing that is being discussed as being completed within the book of Revelation. And this we did look at yesterday. I want to go back there and show it to you again in Revelation chapter um, uh, 10. In Revelation chapter 10, at the sounding of the seventh angel, the trumpet of the seventh angel, verse 7 says, but in, that in, in the days rather uh, of the trumpet call, to be sounded by the seventh angel, here's, here, here's what's important. The mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced by his servants, the prophets. Okay, yesterday we did spend some time looking at how he announced his mystery by the prophets. First Peter chapter 1, again, states that the prophets searched and inquired diligently about the salvation that they were prophesying. They wanted to know more about it. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel says, hey, I don't understand this. What's going on? And the, and the, and the messenger says to Daniel, the man says to Daniel, don't worry about it. Go your way. I think that the, the language of the King James, I think, is Daniel, go your way. In other words, it's, it, it, it's, it's uh, oh, oh, what, what we used to say. It's nacho. In other words, it's nacho business. All right. It, it's, it's none you. It's none you business. Daniel, go your way. The things that you're prophesying about have nothing to do with you. They are for the time of the end. That's when they'll be, re be revealed. So the prophets announced the mystery, but they didn't get to see the fulfillment of it. They didn't get to understand the nature of the salvation that was coming by the mystery of God. But the book of Revelation, two or three times in the book, you'll find similar statements. It is finished it is done. Here, chapter 10, verse 7, the mystery of God would be fulfilled. It would be, I think the old King James, the old King James says that it would be finished. Okay. 
what is the mystery of God? Well, the mystery of God, back here in Ephesians chapter 3, is this. Paul says, this, the mystery is this, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This is the mystery of God, or here in Ephesians 3, the mystery of Christ. It is the, it is the bringing in of the Gentiles as fellow heirs, equal heirs, members not of just a body, but of the same body as the Jews, and now partakers of the promise through the gospel in Jesus Christ. So they have the same standing in the same body, fellow heirs with the Jews. The Gentiles are of equal standing, which, of course, takes you back to, what is that, Romans um, 11, I think is the passage I want. Give me a second here on the verse. Um, um, speaking of the Jews, Paul says in Romans 11, verse 11, did they, the Jews, stumble in order that they might fall? In other words, did God just reject the Jews out of hand? No. Paul says, Paul says by no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their, if their trespass means the riches of the world, meaning by the Jews rejecting the Christ, the Gentiles now get to come in and be grafted in to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the natural tree that's earlier in this, in this section, um, or, or in this section, rather. If their failure means the Gentiles get to come in, what would be, wouldn't it be even better if the Jews came back? And so Paul says, um, the verse down here, here's where we get verse 17, start dealing with the natural tree and some of the branches being broken off so that uh, people could be grafted in. Um, where, where's the verse that I want? Um, um, yeah, verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not, talking to Gentiles here, he says, I do not want you to be unaware. And once again, this term mystery comes up. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. Brothers, a partial hardening has come upon Israel. So some of Israel has fallen away. And it says this, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, until the Gentiles are established in the church as fellow heirs, partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel, in the same body, the fullness of the Gentiles has to be brought into the kingdom. What does that look like? Well, here's what that looks like. Back in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, we have 144,000 out of every tribe of Israel that are sealed. The remnant, the by Old Testament would call it. That remnant is followed because it's necessary that the gospel first go to the Jews that remnant is followed by the innumerable multitude, the multitude that no man could number from every nation, all tribes, all peoples, and all languages. They're standing before the throne, before the Lamb. They are clothed in white robes, palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. Importantly, then, the question comes up. Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? It is a great multitude. No man could number it. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. Sounds kind of like 1 Peter chapter 5, where Peter says that the same sufferings that you're going through are being accomplished through your brother in, to your brotherhood throughout the world. Throughout the world. I wonder if that could be out of every nation, tribe, people, and language. Now, Peter says in 1 Peter 5 that the trials, the fiery trial, is happening to the whole brotherhood throughout all the world. Here, we have the whole world Clothed in, clothed in white robes. Who are these people that are clothed in white robes? Sir, you know, comes the answer. 
He said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. The great tribulation. You can't have two of those. There's only one great tribulation. Because if you have the great tribulation, and then you have a second tribulation that is lesser, the lesser tribulation is not the great tribulation, it's the somewhat bad tribulation. Not great. It's only, it's less than, you can only have one great tribulation. Might you describe it as grievous various trials? Might you describe it, oh, I don't know, as a fiery trial? Since we're dealing with those who are clothed in white robes that are before the throne of God with palm branches in their hands, might we suggest that those in white robes that are coming out of the great tribulation, might we suggest that that is a fiery trial that, I don't know, maybe began at the household of God? I would. Bible's not trying to trick you. It's trying to tell you what it means. It's trying to explain itself to you. 1 Peter 4 is not talking about anything different than the book of Revelation. It's talking about exactly the same thing. The book of Revelation is about the finishing of the mystery of God. The mystery of God is the unification of Jew and Gentile in the church, glorified in the church. That's Daniel 7. What you have pictured here in the book of Revelation, what you have here in the book of Revelation is an image of two groups of people. Two groups of people that have been redeemed, that have been sealed, that have the mark of God on them. The first group comes from Israel, representative out of every tribe. The second group comes from all of the other nations, an innumerable multitude. We can number the number out of Israel. It's going to be a remnant. The rest is innumerable. And that innumerable multitude is established because the fullness of the Gentiles must come in Romans 11. That fullness of the Gentiles, that Peter or, or that John says th through his rec recording of this, of, of, this, of this vision, is an innumerable multitude by the time the Great Tribulation comes along. Because these are the ones who come out of the Great Tribulation. The end of all things is at hand. I wonder what he's talking about. He's not talking about the end of the world. He's not talking about the end of your personal sufferings. He's talking about the finishing of the mystery of God. when Jews and Gentiles are fully established as fellow heirs in the same body. Judgment is going to come. And it is going to test the house of God. It is going to be a period of time that even the righteous are barely going to make it through. We'll talk about that more later because that's a parallel to a statement made in Matthew chapter 24. When we actually get down to verse 17, we'll talk about it there. It's a period of time of intense suffering which will show who's faithful and who's not, whose robes have been washed white and whose have not. That's what's coming. The end of all of this thing, all of the prophecies relating to the completion of the mystery, it's at the doorstep. It's right here. It's right now. 
So Peter's admonition in this book is, I have written briefly to you that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. All of this back in chapter 1, all of this is done according to the foreknowledge of the Father. This Through the prophets, the spirit of Christ that was in the prophets, pro- prophets testified of suffering, the suffering of the Christ. And, and, and yesterday we went through chapters 3 and 4, and we looked at the structure there of how Peter brings that concept of suffering down through the text. I invite you to go back and spend some time looking at that, at that portion of the lesson yesterday. But this suffering of the Christ was prophesied. He left us an example to follow. You're going to go through the great tribulation. That's what Paul is talking about in 2 Timothy 3. All that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Uh, Because there is a persecution. The great tribulation is happening to every saint across the world. What he's talking about. It's here. You are about to reach the culmination of everything that you have been striving for for the last 30 years of Christianity. All these things will take place before the passing of this generation, Matthew chapter 24. This generation, by the time Peter writes, is nearly done. It's on its last legs, and it's time for these things to happen. And so Peter tells them, it's here. It's the same statement that John makes in 1 John chapter 2. Um, 1 John 2, what verse is that? Um, 17 or so? No, 18. Children, it is the last hour. The end of all things is at hand. It's not just the last age, not just the last day. It is the last hour of what? It is the last hour in which all things are going to come to an end. It is the last hour in which all things are going to come to an end, which are going to be signified or seen by a time, time, and where is that? Um, I just saw it for a second of all. It would be for a time, times, and half a time. I highlight that because it's all through the book of Revelation. It would be the end of all things when the shattering of the power of the holy people happens. The fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of their power, the destruction of the priesthood, the temple, and every claim that the holy people, the Jews, had to being the people of Jehovah. The end of their power, the end of their to the supremacy of their claim to be the people of God. It's the end of national Judaism. It's the end of the power of Judaistic theology that taught that the Gentiles had to be the servants of Moses as well as the servants of Jesus. The, the, the shattering of the power of the holy people ended it all. And it says when the shatter, shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end of all of these things would be finished. Amazing how similar that language is to Peter. The end of all of these things will be finished when the holy people are shattered. Now, when the holy people are shattered, who do you think is going to get caught up in that? Did the Romans make a huge distinction? between Jews and Christians in the first century? Is it in Corinth, I believe it is, where there is a disturbance that is created? And the pro-council of Corinth says to Jews and Christians arguing about about Judaism or Christianity, the Roman pro-council looks at them and says, this is a matter of your loss. This is a matter of your religion. I, I have nothing to do with it. They didn't understand the distinction between Jews and Christians. It was all Jewish. And and some Romans and Gentiles have gotten caught up in it, but this is about Judaistic 
the worshiping of Jewish gods. Why would the Romans care? But would the Romans encompass Jerusalem with their armies? Now everybody cares. Because Christians are going to get caught up in that too. And when the power of the holy people is shattered, guess who's going to get caught up in it? The time is come that judgment will begin with the people of God. There's no other time that fits a biblical timeline other than the first century. The only time that fits. That's what we're dealing with here. We are dealing with the end of the prophecies relating to the mystery. The mystery being completed when the fullness of the Gentiles are come in. The Gentiles are established, that's Romans 11. The Gentiles are established as fellow heirs. Uh, Hebrews 3, or, or Ephesians 3 rather. When an innumerable multitude of Gentiles have washed their robes right, washed their robes white, rather, excuse me, Romans or Revelation 7, and so on. That's what we're talking about. That's the time frame. That's the people. That's what 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 7 is discussing. The end of this period of the Great Tribulation is nearly here. Because that end is here, you'd better make sure that you are armed with the same way of thinking that Jesus was. He suffered the righteous for the unrighteous. You're going to be suffering right now, even though you're righteous, you're going to be suffering at the hands of the unrighteous, and you're going to be suffering, if you're a Christian, identified by the Roman armies as belonging to that to, to the gods of the, the God of the, of the Jews, you're going to be suffering because of the sin of the zealots of Judaism, it's going to impact you as well. You need to be mind, mindful of the mind of Christ, and you need to make sure that you have ceased from sin. So Peter's repeated admonition through chapter 2, 3, and 4 is, if you suffer, don't suffer as an evildoer. Suffer as a Christian. So that when you suffer for unjustly for this cause, the Romans are out there killing all of the re re rebellious Jews, don't rebel with them because you'll look just like them. You go the other direction. The Jews are rebelling and it's going to fail. The power of the holy people is going to be shattered. You need to reject that. You need to live a holy life. You need to be in submission to the powers that be. That will distinguish you from the rebel the rebel Jews that are going to be just, that are going to be shattered. Don't follow them, particularly if you are a Jew, you're in double jeopardy. Turn yourself away, don't go that way. Understand because of other people's actions, you're about to suffer. And judgment is going to start with you. You're not ancillary. You're not on the tangent. You are right in the midst of this, and it's going to impact you. So you need to be mentally prepared that you're about to suffer unjustly. In order to get through that, you need to make sure you're not sinning. Don't give anybody any cause to get you caught up in that tribulation. Don't do it. Don't, don't go out and live the way that they're doing. Don't live in that same flood of de debauchery. Understand that God is ready to bring judgment. And if you're living wrong, when this judgment begins at the house of God, you're going to get caught up in it. Be prepared. Be ready. It's here. It is here. And it's here now. The end of it is here now. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Redeem the time, Paul would say to the Ephesians, for the time is evil. See, again, how many times have you read that passage? How many times have you read that, read that passage telling people to redeem the time for the time is evil? Redeem the days, rather, for the time is evil. 
and you've made it generic, haven't you? I guarantee you that's what you've done. We live in an evil age, and so we need to redeem the days, redeem the time, because our age is evil. Okay, that's true. I mean, look around, our world is evil. That's true. Not what he's talking about. It's not what Paul's talking about to the Ephesians. The last time I checked, the first of the seven churches of Asia in Revelation chapter 2, remind me, refresh my memory, what's the first one that Jesus addresses? Ephesus. Paul tells them the evil day is coming. This present age, the evil day is here. Take upon you the whole armor of God and redeem the time. Make sure during this great tribulation of a time, time, and half of a time, of, 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 of 1,300 days, plus or minus, there's a couple of different renderings there, of, of 42 months, as Revelation calls it, of, of, of uh, uh, the, the times of the Gentile being fulfilled, Luke chapter 21, of 42 months. For the next three and a half years, the half week of Daniel, of Daniel 9, these three and a half years are going to be the hardest three and a half years you've ever gone through that the world will ever know for people of faith. You'd better be prepared. And you'd better be self-controlled and sober-minded. You need to be aware of the time, and you need to be aware of, 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 your, of your actions within that time. As we might say, you need to have your head screwed on straight, and you need to mind your business. Because if you don't, it's a time in which the righteous will scarcely make it out. Can't afford to get caught up in the fallout. Because this is it. If you mess it up now, your life is forfeit. That's the importance of this thought that the end of all things is at hand. We will pick up here tomorrow, uh, Lord willing, and, and talk more specifically about being self-controlled and sober-minded. An interesting statement there. You do it for the sake of your prayers, which he has just mentioned back in chapter 3 relating to the husband and wife. He now makes another statement about the efficacy of prayer and what's needed in prayer. Um, and then that leads us into a, a great discussion there in verses 8 through 12 about uh, uh, not just the avoidance of wrong activity during the period of this tribulation, but of the application of positive attributes to help yourself and also to help others during the period of tribulation. So great thoughts there in verses 8 through 12, and we'll cover some portion of that, uh, Lord willing, tomorrow. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and wrap up this, the, the show today. Uh, great to have you all back with me. A uh, pretty good crowd throughout the day. Not, not our largest crowd, but uh, for, for having taken almost two weeks off, uh, good, good crowd here today. Appreciate you tuning in and being a part of the program. Lots of participation, lots of comments. I didn't get to a bunch of them, uh, but we'll do our best to get back to uh, some of the questions you put in the first hour. A couple more about baptism. I probably need to go back and look at uh, tomorrow, but uh, do, do appreciate all of, uh, all, all of your thoughts. Uh, and uh, thank you for tuning in and being a part of the program. Uh, top of the hour here, 10 o'clock, Truth Tuesday would normally be on. We'll not be on today because uh, Daryl is over at uh, Vanderbilt Medical. Uh, so we will hopefully get them back here, uh, Lord willing, next week on the 27th. I believe that's when they're planning on being back. Uh, but don't miss uh, Tony Brewer and Aaron Dotson at 11 o'clock for Christianity Now. And then tonight uh, for Connect, going to have a special episode with, <laughs> uh, with Paul Mays, uh, and um, um, some other people dealing with uh, a conversation about uh, their their journey to, uh, to, to to becoming Christians, and I'm looking forward to it. I know it's going to be a a good time. So um, um, thank you again for tuning in. We'll see you tonight for Connect at 7 o'clock. Until then, as always, it's my prayer that you will go out and uh, make your day a great one for God. Have a good night.